church a special message to prepare the world for Jesus coming and you let out in the uh, the leading the calling of individuals who were willing to give of their time and their energy to bring this message to the world so today as we look back we give you thanks Lord and pray that the lessons that we can learn will be imparted to our lives so that we can have that same vision and that same zeal that they had in Jesus name we pray amen Today we're thinking about Uriah Smith. Now, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a few things about his life. We're going to take a look at his leg, his conversion, his ministry, some of his problems, and some of the solutions of those problems. Let me introduce the topic today by asking a question because the question or the answer to the question contains a, a vital principle that we need to keep in mind. The question is simply, does God sometimes use people in his work that aren't perfect? Does he sometimes use people that don't have it all perfectly wrapped up together and have a, uh, a perfect consciousness of his plan, his word, his prophecies? Does he sometimes use people like that? Yes, he does. God's love is amazing. And uh, we're going to put up that slide now because we, we uh, have been in the habit, we're trying to start the habit of repeating this great text in the Bible, John 3.16 and 17, because it keeps in focus what this is all about. We're here to worship this great God of. So re would you repeat this with me, please? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did send not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God could have used angels to do this work of spreading the good news, but he did not. He chose weak, erring, fallible mortals whom in our scripture lesson are described as clay jars, earthen vessels. And we find that in the Bible, I, I looked up at least five different examples of how God used people that weren't perfect to spread his word. Think back just for a minute on some of these examples. There was John the Baptist. God used him, didn't he? Was John the Baptist perfect in his knowledge though? Or did he have a few things that weren't absolutely correct? Well, like many of his day, he believed that the Messiah would come up, come and set up an earthly kingdom. He didn't have that part of it perfectly uh, understood in his mind. But God used him, didn't he? Yeah. One time John got discouraged and sent a, a delegation when he was in prison and said to Jesus, Are you the one? Or should we look for somebody else? But God used John. And what about the other John? John the Revelator, we say. John who wrote the Gospel of John and the letters. Did he have everything in perfect order and in perfect understanding? Well, do you remember the time when they went to a village, Jesus and the disciples went to a village, and the, the village wasn't ready to hear what, what they had to say. They rejected him. And what was John's uh, proposal in that situation? He said, uh, should we call down fire from heaven and consume them? And I think Jesus probably sadly shook his head and said, no, John, that's not what... That's not what it's about. I've come to save lives and not destroy. So even John, at a certain point in his life, didn't have it completely correct. What about Peter? Was he also one of these earthen vessels, one of these clay jars? Yes, we find that uh, even after the cross and after the resurrection and after the day of Pentecost, Peter still had some growing to do. Remember the story in Acts chapter 12 when Peter was imprisoned and an angel was sent. Peter was asleep there being bound in the chains and what did the angel do? The Bible says the angel smote Peter. Had to wake him up. That's in Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 10, the Lord had to wake Peter up. Not by an angel smiting him, but by a vision that was given three different times because on his way, just about ready to knock at the door where he was staying, were some people from... Cornelius, somebody non-Jewish. And Peter, Peter had to be instructed that, you know what, the gospel is for everybody. And that vision was given to him three times to wake him up to the news that, yes, 
people of non-Jewish origin are candidates for salvation. So there was a time when Peter didn't have everything correct. And even after that, even though he accepted the message of the vision and ministered to Cornelius and the people that had gathered to hear the word, even after that he stumbled on that point a little bit. You remember? And he, no, I, I, I'm not sure I can eat with these people. They're of non-Jewish faith. And Paul had to give him a word of encouragement on that. What about the, um, the travelers to Emmaus after, after the resurrection of Christ? Did they have everything perfect, perfectly in order? No, as they went along the road, they were joined by someone they perceived to be a stranger. It was actually Jesus. And uh, he said, why are you so sorrowful? And he said, oh, haven't you heard the news? The one that we hoped had, would, would be the one to deliver Israel instead died on the cross. And what did Jesus do? Patiently, kindly, he opened to their understanding the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So they were not of perfect understanding. The Bible tells a story about another individual by the name of Apollos, a man who was, it says, mighty in the scriptures. It says there in Acts 18, verse 25 and 20, 26, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Aquila and Priscilla, they were lay people by the way, heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Interesting story. To his credit, Apollos was humble enough to receive the encouragement of these lay people and, and uh, internalize the message that they gave him. So we see in all these stories that God used people. God loved people and he used people even though they had growing to do. And it's important to see that principle uh, because some of the ones that led out in the formation of our church were also earthen vessels, clay jars, that at different times did not have it perfectly straight together. But God loved them and God used them. And we should be as charitable toward them in their errors, in their times of error, as we would, as we would be toward Peter or Apollos or the Emmaus travelers. Among those uh, was Uriah Smith. I'll tell you right now, he did not have everything perfectly together at all times. But God loved him and there, there's a, a wonderful blessing in studying his life. Uh, when we think about that, how God gently led Uriah along his path, uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, it's not just his story. It's our story too, isn't it? Because what does the Bible say? Proverbs 4.18 the way of the, of the just is, is a path that grows ever brighter. And we can be thankful that the God that we serve uh, accepts us as we are and leads us from this point to higher ground along our journey. So let's go back and think about the life of this man, Uriah Smith. You remember about uh, four or five weeks ago, we took a look at his, his older sister, Annie, Annie Smith. She was four years older than Uriah. And they, they, their family uh, were, were adherents to the teachings of this man, William Miller. Miller had been preaching for 12 years or so by that time that Christ was coming back. And the year 1844 was designated to be the year of the fulfillment of that. And the, the Smith family be, uh, began to be joined in with that movement that spread across many different denominations. It was not a church, it was a movement within many different denominations. Well, of course, 1844, October, October 22 came and went and Jesus hadn't come back. And that resulted in a, a great disappointment among those that had looked for him to come. What happened to those that had uh, been part of the Millerite movement? Well, a great number of them basically dropped out of religion completely. And among that group were the Smith family. They just kind of let religion go and went back into the uh, ways and practices of the world. At least Annie and her brother, that could be said about, about that. Well, a number of years went by, remember we, when we talked about Annie Smith, and um, Joseph Bates, another of the Adventist pioneers, paid a visit to Annie's mother. She expressed concern about uh, the path that her daughter had, had gone on. And Bates said, well, where is she living? And uh, it was disclosed to him that she lived in Boston at that time, pursuing her passions of art and poetry and sculpturing and so on. And uh, Bates said, well, I'm going to be holding meetings there. Uh, why don't you invite her to come to these meetings? It's going to be held in a certain sister's house. And you remember when we talked about Annie Smith, how that when Bates went there and the night before the meetings were supposed to start, 
Bates was given an unusual dream in which he saw the room in which the meeting was going to take place filled to capacity except one vacant chair near the back where the door was and just at the time the meeting was supposed to start a young lady slipped in and occupied that seat and what Bates didn't know was that basically the same dream had been given to Annie Smith the night before the meetings and it encouraged her to go to that meeting she lost her way and so arrived late but when she opened the door into the room it was just as she had seen in her dream all the seats were taken except that one vacant chair at the end near the door and Bates saw her come in and he changed course in midstream there and preached on something else and then afterward he went up and talked to Annie and because they, as they became acquainted they realized a similar dream had been given. Anyway, Annie returned to the Lord and joined the now we would call Sabbath keeping Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventist Church had not yet been formed and uh, became a part of it. Anne invited her brother also, Uriah, to return to the Lord and join the group that were keeping the Lord's Sabbath and uh, uh, and he did. Now you remember that Annie loved poetry, submitted a poem to the review, and uh, the editor of the review was James White. He liked the poem so much that he not only published it, but invited Annie to come on staff. And she became a proofreader there and spent the few remaining years of her life in that ministry. Well, uh, Uriah also enjoyed poetry. And so uh, it was shortly right about this time that he also wrote a poem uh, and submitted it to the review. But his poem was a little bit different than his sister's, I have to tell you. Uh, the title of Uriah's poem was The Warning Voice of Time and Prophecy. Uh, what made it particularly different was the length of it. Uriah's poem was about 35,000 words in length. Now, I don't know exactly how long that is in terms of uh, printed page, but I think the eight pages of my my sermon here were probably uh, short of 35,000 words or so. That's a long poem. It was published though, but as a serial. It was not, not all at one time. But because of that and because of his sister's contacts, Uriah was also invited, invited to become a part of the review staff and he joined, uh, joined that uh, shortly after 1852 and he basically gave his life in the ministry of being uh, associated with the Review and Herald magazine. Much of it as being its editor. Some 50 years he gave in that work. When, when he and his sister joined up with the Review, um, it was at substantial sacrifice. Because right about that time there was a new school that was uh, starting. It was called uh, Mount Vernon Academy. It was not a church school. Uh, and, but they were looking for good teachers. And so they offered to each Annie and Uriah, brother and sister, they offered a standing contract to be on the faculty of this Mount Vernon Academy uh, for a three-year term at the princely salary of $1,000 a year. Now if you do the math and go back, you'll find that that is a very, very high salary for this pre-Civil War period in which, in which they engaged. But they, each of them turned it down. Instead, they wanted to work for the Review. What did they get for their labors working at the Review? Well, it wasn't $1,000 a year. They got their board and care and some clothes. Now, within some, some time, Uriah was promoted to be the editor of the review. Here's what he had to say when, when uh, he was given that promotion. He said, I do not enter upon this position for ease, comfort, or worldly profit. For I have seen by my connection with the review thus far that neither of these is to be found here. <laughs> this is what Annie wrote when she began her career uh, working for the review at, at Great Sacrifice. She said, Earth has entirely lost its attractions. My hopes, joys, Affections are now all centered in things above and divine. I want no other place than to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. No other occupation than to be in his service, in the service of my heavenly Father. No other delight than the peace of God which passes all understanding. Isn't that a wonderful testimony? And we have to believe that Uriah, her brother, shared uh, in the same things. But uh, we're going to step back just a little further now before that and talk about Uriah and his leg. Anybody know about Uriah and his leg? 
Raise your hand if you know anything about Uriah and his leg. Well, when he was 13 years old, Uriah uh, found that he contracted an infection in his leg. And this was long before some of the other things became available to fight infection. And uh, Uriah lost his leg at a point above his knee. He became am an amputee. Uh, but Uriah was uh, a, a person of strong conviction. And uh, as we would say today, he turned the lemons into lemonade. Now before this time, what could you do if you uh, suffered an amputation like that? Well, if you look in the artwork and do a little bit of study, you'll find that basically the options were, were quite primitive and uh, you could have like a stump really there hanging to be your prosthesis. But Uriah set his mind about trying to develop something with a, uh, uh, that would be a little more accommodating and he developed a, a prosthetic limb with a movable ankle. Now this was a huge leap in terms of of uh, prosthetics and their usability and he is still recognized as being a pioneer in the development of now modern prosthetics which have uh, advanced leaps and bounds but Uriah made a significant contribution to the medical field by his invention of this uh, uh, le leg with a movable ankle. And that's not the only thing he invented. He also invented a, a uh, child's school desk that had a folding seat which was uh, thought to be a great, great improvement back in their day. In fact, he was given $3,000 uh, for the sale of that patent. And he accepted that and with that money built his house. So he was a, a man of keen, keen thinking. Now let's think about some of his uh, accomplishments that he um, achieved there working for the church. It's quite impressive. In 1863, about 10 years after he became a part of the Sabbath keeping Advent group, uh, the church was organized and, and uh, uh, given its, its name, 1861, that was chosen. But in 1863, it was officially legally organized. And Uriah Smith was appointed or elected to be the secretary of the General Conference. It was a position that he would hold five different times in his life. He also served as General Conference treasurer uh, on occasion. In 1874, about 10 years after that or so, uh, Battle Creek College our first college was established and he was the first Bible teacher at Battle Creek College. He had uh, many other talents too. Remember Annie had, had uh, interest in art and sculpturing and painting and so on. So did Uriah. And he worked at the Review and Herald publishing the magazine and many of the early illustrations were the, were the works of his hand. He was an engraver and he was able to put forth the illustrations that went into the magazine. He tells about how they put together their books and pamphlets. And uh, you might smile to hear how, how, how it was done. The pages of their books were hand holed by a shoemaker's pegging awl. Okay, edge of the sheet, now we're making the holes so that the stitching can take place to make a book. Done by a shoemaker's pegging awl. And then they would take a straight edge and Uriah Smith would pull out his penknife and he would trim off the edges of the pages and this is what he had to say. We blistered our hands in the operation. Often the tracks in form were not half so true and square as the doctrines they taught. But they worked with joy. They loved their work there and they put their all into it. Now Smith offered, authored some 25 different books. He's quite a prolific author. And of course the book for which he is uh, most known is the Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. Anybody have that book either in the library or remember reading it as a kid? Uh, I remember when I was uh, young and we had that volume, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, and there were the illustrations of these prophetic beasts in Daniel 7, and I remember looking at those and pondering their, their significance. There were awesome, awesome uh, pictures in that. Actually, that was uh, drafted in two separate volumes originally. Book on Daniel, book on Revelation. But then one of the um, early Advent believers by the name of George King came up with an idea. And he said, you know, uh, this message has to go to the world. We must find a way to put these books in people's hands. We ought to develop a system so that uh, salespeople could go door to door and sell the volumes. Uh, and they thought, well, what, what would be an appropriate volume uh, to put in the hands of these, what we call now, coal porters? And so the first book 
that was used in that way was uh, Smith's Daniel and Revelation being combined into one volume and put in the hands of the salespeople who then went door to door selling that book. Was Uriah perfect? No, he was not. He was a clay vessel. He was an earthen jar. But as we've seen, so were John the Baptist, John the Revelator, Peter, and Apollos, and so so many others. It may seem it may seem strange to you now, looking back with our perfect 2020 hindsight, that uh, Uriah Smith had some struggles. He had some struggles on the teaching of the deity of Christ and the Trinity. It may seem odd that this man who was so used by God became out of balance for a time, respecting salvation by faith and the centrality of grace in God's plan. Let me share a little background with you on that that might help, uh, help us understand it. Not to excuse it, not to justify it, but to understand it. All of this led to a, a historic general conference session in the year 1888. Uh, it's human nature to emphasize that which makes us distinct and different. Let's suppose, just for an example, that uh, you were the owner of a, um, a hybrid car. Let's say it was a uh, Toyota Prius. And somebody asked you about your car. And uh, so you said, well, let me tell you about my car. It has four wonderful air-filled tires that give it a very nice, soft, cushiony ride. There's a round device there that sits right in front of me, and I use that, and I can make that thing go wherever I want. Now, if somebody did that, what would the thought come to your mind? You'd say, well, all cars have that. Tell me about your Prius. And then you might say something about how... Uh, extraordinary fuel efficiency can be achieved by a combination of other fuel sources beside fossil fuels. That's what makes it different, right? Well, there's a tendency to do that. And there was a tendency for our early Adventist uh, teachers and, and uh, preachers to do that. I want to make it clear that this tendency was, was not revealed by all, okay? But, by, but it was by many. And that tendency was to emphasize things like the Sabbath, to emphasize things like the sanctuary and the 2300 days and the various aspects of prophecy uh, to the point where the central message of salvation by grace through faith was put on a lower pedestal because it was thought, all Christians know that, let's talk about those things that are really distinctive. And so for many, not all, because you can go back into the Signs of the Times articles, I have the big blue books, and you can read many fine sermons on salvation by grace through faith at varying times there. It was not completely lost, but it was not emphasized, it was not put in its proper place. And I will say also, while I'm on that topic, that if you go through the entire scope of the, the writings of Sister White, you will find that there's always a balance on this matter. Read the first four, four volumes of the testimonies that were, were written before that and, and salvation by grace through faith is given due prominence for sure in those volumes. But nevertheless, many of the Adventist preachers had fallen into the pattern of focusing so much on the Sabbath and these other things that uh, righteousness by faith was, was, was not in the spotlight like it should have been. Now keep in mind that uh, just before this uh, historic 1888 Bible uh, General Conference session, uh, the Sabbath had been brought into the spotlight uh, through, through, um, through legal means. Willie White, Willie White, who was the youngest son of Sister White, had been working out at uh, Pacific Press in Oakland and he was operating the printing press on Sunday and he was arrested for doing that because he was breaking a Sunday law. And there were many Adventist pastors who had been put in jail and even been put on chain gangs in places like Tennessee and Arkansas for breaking uh, Sunday Sabbath uh, legislation. So um, you can understand why, why there might have been a tendency among some to so emphasize matters having to do with the Sabbath and, and so on that these other things came um, not into the prominence they should have been. Well, what happened in 1888 then? Two, two brothers, uh, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagoner, 
gave presentations at that general conference for the purpose of putting back into the spotlight the beautiful teaching of the Bible of righteousness by faith. The sad thing about that was that many of the brethren looked at that as being kind of a threat, uh, thinking that, well, now we're, we're doing away with our position about the importance of obeying God's law and these other things, and they resisted and rejected the message that, that was given to them. And, and sad to say, it was not only true that it was rejected, but there were, it was done in an unchrist, unchristian-like way. Harsh words were spoken, you know, when we get uh, our defenses up and our hair rises and our, uh, the color of our skin changes, sometimes our voice becomes high-pitched and things come out of our mouth that we're, we're uh, regretful of later, but, but they, the harsh words were spoken and an unchristian spirit was manifested by many at that conference, which was, was not proper at all. And to make matters worse for uh, Uriah Smith and uh, George Butler, who was president of the General Conference at that time, uh, it, it, it was revealed that Sister White was taking the side of Jones and Wagner, and that, that made it even worse for them. Well, what happened after that? I'm going to give you just one thumbnail sketch thought, because we will be covering these things at another time when we go through some of the history of our church. But following that session, uh, Sister White and Jones and Wagner, the three of them, went, th went through a tour for three years um, from coast to coast, from conference to conference, from church to church, sharing the message of Christ's righteousness with the people. And it was, it was evidently quite successful in what they did. Here's what Sister White had to say about, uh, about Wagner. Elder E.J. Wagner had the privilege granted, of, uh, granted him of speaking plainly and presenting his views upon justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law. This was no new light, but it was old light placed where it should be in the third angel's message. Now I want to share with you some thoughts then that Uriah Smith, who in his later years came to a different way of thinking. I want to share some thoughts that he put in a, into the preface of a, book that, of a book that he published in 1898, ten years after that general conference session. The title of the book that he authored is Looking Unto Jesus. And in the preface, uh, here's what he said. To look unto Jesus is one of the most prominent injunctions of the Word of God. In him is found the acme of all divine excellence. We are to look to him as the one sent forth from the Father to be, in his own person, his representative among men. We look to him as our teacher and guide. We look to him as our example, the author and finisher of our faith. But above all, we look to him as our Savior and Redeemer, the hope and source of everlasting life. But in this field, many false beacons have been erected, not to give warning of danger, but to lure to disaster. For the one end, which the enemy of all righteousness has sought and still seeks to gain, is to have our Lord Jesus Christ placed in a false light before the world. So we are asked by some to look unto Jesus as only a man. One most perfect man, to be sure, that ever lived, but still only human, not the divine Son of the Eternal Father and one with the Father in essential perfection. We are told to look at, at him as a created being, not as the one who proceeded and came forth from God in such a way that the mysterious expression, the only begotten Son of God, can be applied to him. We are asked to regard him as one that had no personal existence previous to the time when he was born of the Virgin Mary, thus ignoring his glorious achievements in the beginning and the glory he had with the Father before the world was. We are called to look upon him as the one who will be simply the author of the happiness of the future world, instead of being the sole author and source of even the life itself that will be manifested in, in that future world. Thus is our Lord misrepresented in his nature, his being, and his marvelous doings. The object of this work, as he introduces his new book now, is to so present him that the view of those under whose eyes it may come may lo no longer be subject to the aberrations of these false media, but see him as he is, indeed, and in truth, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Uriah did some growing. He wasn't perfect. Uh, none of the clay jars, the earthen vessels that God used were. But God did use him in a marvelous way. And today I say praise God for Uriah Smith. We don't hold him up as a paragon of virtue, but we, 
we look at him as an example of the one that God used. And his passion and his zeal and his sacrifice will be well worth our emulation. We're even closer to the end than he was. May God bless us to carry forth the message to the world and have that same vision as Uriah had. The closing song that we're going to use today is the only one in our hymnal that uh, he authored. He authored a number of hymns, but the only one in our hymnal is this one, page uh, 602. Old Brother, Be Faithful.